my voice. Andrew, thank you for your love for me, bro. Guys, pray for the internet connectivity in Jesus' name. The Lord Jesus, drown us, flood us in his holy blood. The Lord Jesus, wash us, purify us, cleanse us in his holy blood. The blood of Jesus Christ, cleanse us, cleanse me of my filth, crucify my flesh, and forgive me for failing him in Jesus' name. We love you, Son of God. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, <clears throat> virgin-born Son of Mary. We love you, Son of David. We love you, Lord of glory. We love you, Lamb of God. Cover us by your blood. Wash us in your blood, Lord Jesus, and fill us with the Spirit. And Lord Jesus, for your glory, anoint my mouth to speak truth without error, to recall scripture and interpret it correctly for your glory, Lord Jesus, and the power of your Holy Spirit. Grant me wisdom and knowledge from your Spirit <clears throat> to bless your people, Lord Jesus. Wash them, cover them in the blood of Jesus. Wash our loved ones, my daughters, in your blood, Lord Jesus. Cover them in the blood of Jesus, your blood, the blood of the Lamb, Lord Jesus, Son of God. <clears throat> bless this session. Bless the internet connection. Save us from our flesh. Save us from our shortcomings. Save us from the evil one. Save us from the world and keep us in love with you, Lord Jesus. Keep us <clears throat> worshiping you by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus. Have your way this session, Lord. And Lord Jesus, <clears throat> heal me. Heal us all spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically. <clears throat> and Lord Jesus, fill my lungs, my chest, my throat with the breath of life from your spirit, <clears throat> Lord. And keep my voice strong. And anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Lord Jesus. Please, Lord. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on us and forgive us and be patient with us. And help us to be patient with one another, Lord Jesus. And bless our families. Bless my daughters. Wash them in the blood of Jesus. Fill them with your love. Wash them in your blood, Lord Jesus. Bless this session and save us from attacks of the enemy <clears throat> and be exalted. You are the eternal Son of God, the eternal heart of the Father the eternal word of God that became flesh. And we love you, the God-man, the Anthropos, in Jesus' name. <clears throat> I'm a little under the weather. You'd think I'm in another state that's warm. I wouldn't get sick, but I'm sick. So pray that if Jesus Christ, our Lord, is pleased, he'll help me recover. Don't have health insurance. So I trust in the great phys physician, Jesus, our Lord, our God and Savior, who's in love with us, and may we be in love with you, Lord Jesus, by the power of the Spirit. Yahovah Rapha, Yeshua Rapha, the great physician, heal me. And if you <clears throat> love me for his sake, pray for my daughters always, that the Lord Jesus will provide over abundantly for them and keep them in love with him and provide their every need in Jesus' name. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. You're saying if I don't feel up to it. Well, it's not that I don't feel up to it. Someone is asking me, am I okay? Come on, Andrew. Think about it. Serenity, may the Lord Jesus grant you perfect healing and wholeness. And by the stripes of Jesus, by the wounds of the Lamb, you are whole, all of us in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Andrew, if you were me, would you be okay? Because someone asked me, was concerned, saying, hey, are you okay? Am I okay? Come on. If you were me and you had my personality, right? And you know the people that I know, you'd be far from okay, right? I mean, who <clears throat> poses for the camera as a thumbnail with his foot in front of the camera in what was supposed to be a kung fu form? I was supposed to be doing an extended front kick, right? But I almost lost my balance. And thank goodness I didn't fall because that would have caused an earthquake, an earthquake, Right? Exactly. Not thumbnail, but toenail. And an earthquake, the magnitude of which would have never been felt prior. Right? Hey, what's up, Bubba's? I love my Bubba's. You guys see that name, Asher Dicolata? <clears throat> you see him? Uh, he is a dear, precious brother to my heart. Asher Dicolata, because he's he has his nick, so that's why I'm mentioning him. If he had changed his nick, I wouldn't have said it. Just to let you know, Asher Dikleta is family. I'm not going to mention where uh, where we're, you know, I don't want to mention location. But anyway, he is one of the precious brothers that is actually one of my best friends, a brother in Christ, who has been there for me prayerfully, praying for me and my daughters, him and his lovely family. The Lord Jesus bless him and his family. So pray for our brother, Asher Dikleta. He's also good friends with Big Al. You know who Big Al is, Asher. He comes usually. He'll pony show me. He comes, listen. Al, you know. Al Amari. 
So this guy is actually, and by the way, Asher Dikleta can tell you some horror stories. The brother knew me before I was in the Christian faith. 1611 on your way to heaven. I miss you, brother. I miss you. <clears throat> Just let me share, share something with you. As you can see, my voice, because sore throat, pray, the Holy Spirit will fill my lungs with the breath of life so I can do justice to this topic. Asher Dikaleta can tell you, he's an Assyrian like I am, who fell in love with Jesus years ago, married a godly wife, has beautiful children. But he remembers me in my pre-Christian days. He remembers me when I used to be a bodybuilder. <laughs> I'm laughing. Looking at me, a bodybuilder, lifting weights. He remembers when I used to be like 220 a muscle, had a flat stomach, didn't have abs yet, 18 and three-quarter inch arms. He remembers. And he remembers that when I used to shake hands, I would look at people. In my arrogance, this is how I would shake hands. So let's say the camera is someone. I'd say, hey, what are you doing? And then I had a bad habit of doing this. And you still see me do this. Okay? He can confirm if I'm lying. <clears throat> he can confirm if I'm lying. You know why I used to do that? Like I do this, right, with my – I don't know. It's a, I got to keep a jury. Because believe it or not, I learned the trick of the trade from bodybuilders. My older brother is still a muscular beast. I'm the youngest of six children. We're four boys and two girls. My older brother, the one who's the second youngest, <clears throat> he's now 53, and he's still a muscular behemoth. He's a giant. He's a beast. He got me into working out in the 90s, and he worked out with Sergio Olivia, the man who beat Arnold Schwarzenegger, because Sergio Olivia used to be a Chicago cop. Yeah, I used to do kickboxing, honestly, Sam. And I joke about that. I used to do it. Right. So Sergio Olivia. So they taught me some tricks. One of the tricks is if you want your pecs to stick out and look more ripped, you got to do this. OK, you got to do this with the, you know, what do I call it? Areola. Yeah. So that it makes the lower pec line stick out more prominently. And so that's been a habit. And here, another secret. And I don't want to bore you with all these details, but we're just waiting a few more minutes for people to show up. If Hader Wood can get 900, I can get 2,000 by the grace of God. Now, I even started drinking black coffee because of bodybuilding. In the 90s, there was a local 7-Eleven right by my home where the gym was. And Sergio Olivia told my brother, don't drink water while you're working out. Drink coffee because coffee <clears> – <throat> Jacks up your metabolism. Guess what I did? I started drinking coffee, black coffee, which I do to this day. That's how I started drinking black coffee. And because I'm in full-time ministry and I'm barely making it, right, I have to get McDonald's coffee because it costs a buck. <laughs> no, but anyway, all joking aside. So anyway, keep praying that God helps me to lose more weight and get healthier for his glory. Yes, and Asher will tell you, there was a jewel in our area, in a Dominix. He will tell you that even now, even now, I have, I'm, I've attained legendary st status where I used to live because I'm known as the greatest kickboxer of the 20th century. Because every day I would go to the Dominic's and Jewel and kick more boxes than any human being on the face of the planet. That's why pretty soon you're going to see me in the Guinness Book of World Records. Okay, Just don't hate. <clears throat> Brother, keep praying. I don't know what's going on. So, guys, thank you for asking. Sam's asking my situation. I don't know what's going on. I have no word. But I'm sure I'm still not out of... <clears throat> the neck of the woods, right? So pray for a miracle for this year, that this year, the Lord Jesus and his infinite love that I don't deserve for the sake of my children whom he loves will grant me miraculous, miraculous deliverance. No more shackles, no more strictures, miraculous deliverance and provision. Please, I'm still not out of <clears throat> the situation because I haven't heard anything and pray that nothing bad happens, that I'm free to serve Jesus. So thank you for asking. Right. And so let's begin the discussion. Today, someone sent me 
by the way, here, if you guys have topics or objections, <clears throat> sort of, I've been doing that sort of truth. And sort of truth, you know, I love you for the sake of the Lord. If any time I'm tough with any of you, take that as an older brother, if not a spiritual father, who wants the best for you for the sake of Jesus, right? Best for you because I love you for the sake of Jesus, and I want you guys to be the best for Jesus. I do intermittent fasting, and it works wonders for me, right? I just got to make sure I spend more time in the gym, but I haven't been able to because I'm transitioning. I was going to say one point. So we get, yeah, oh, this is what I was going to say. If you guys have objections you want me to answer, leave me a comment in the comment section or leave me a comment on Facebook, and I'll try to get to those. Someone asked me about 1 Corinthians 15, 28. I have done sessions, and this is another thing I want to encourage you to do. Go back and start listening to my sessions that I started doing over two years ago. There's a lot of meat. Now, thank the Lord. I have more viewers now. And people, I have more people watching these recent videos, but the older videos, I don't have many people who have watched them. And to be honest, there's a lot of meat in those previous sessions, a lot of meat. So go back, start watching them, hit the like button, pass them on. I have addressed 1 Corinthians 15, 28 in one of the previous sessions, but silly me, I didn't title some of the sessions. So I don't know which session... And when I address 1 Corinthians 15, 28. So now I'm going to be more systematic. Hopefully by the grace of God this year, I'm going to do short videos and lengthy sessions. By his grace, by his mercy, as I start learning to work my way around YouTube, like David Wood did. And again, let me repeat. I get tired of answering this. <clears throat> Hadith, salam. How are you, buddy? Brother, if I want to go to hell, I will revert to Islam and follow Muhammad to hell because Muhammad is burning in hell. God forbid, Jesus forgive, for, forbid, and Jesus forgive me for even ever, ever entertaining the thought of becoming a Muslim. That has not entered my mind. In Jesus' name, it will never enter my mind. I will die worshiping the triune God, Jesus, Muhammad's God, judge, and destroyer. Now, if I want to go to hell, I'll follow your prophet. If I want to prostitute women, I'll follow your prophet. <clears throat> If I want to rape married women after killing their family members, murdering them, I'll follow your prophet. If I want to smooch a black stone, I'll follow your prophet, right? If I want to have concubines, I'll follow your prophet, right? So, but in Jesus' name, may Jesus wipe out the name and memory of Muhammad and save people like you from the filth of Islam, the darkness of Allah, <clears throat> The gross immorality, bloodlust of this wicked antichrist named Muhammad in Jesus' name. May he save you from that. Okay. Now I was going to say something, then he distracted me. Folks, do pray. I'm going to be moving in to my new place February 15th. Pray for that door of blessing. Pray for provision that the Lord will provide <clears throat> so that I can be able to manage. With that said, okay. Uh, number one, you can't pray for me because Allah doesn't exist. He doesn't hear prayers. <clears throat> number two, although I'm your brother in humanity, you're not my brother in Christ. I pray you'll be my brother in Christ and he'll save you from Muhammad in Jesus' name. Now, I had mentioned this in the past. Let me repeat this. The Companion Bible. Do you remember the series I did in refuting the serpent seed theory? A theory made quite popular by Pastor Arnold Murray of the Shepherd's Chapel, Chapel. Well, when I used to listen to the Shepherd's Chapel, Pastor Arnold Murray, he would recommend, he goes, all serious students of the Bible and serious students of the chapel, you have to have a strong concordance and E.W. Bullinger's The Companion Bible. And here is the one I bought from his ministry. It cost me 100 bucks Back then, that was a lot of money. Here it is. Phenomenal. Now, that doesn't mean <clears throat> Bullinger's commentary is inspired and errant. It's not. Only the books of the Bible are inspired, inerrant, infallible, preserved by the triune God. Only. The closest thing to an inspired commentary you'll get besides from the Bible is when I speak and write. I'm the closest thing.
to infallibility, this side of glory. And in fact, Asher de Kaleda has appointed me the Protestant Pope. And he is my <clears throat> college of bishops. Okay, They call me Papa Sammy. Just kidding. I'm playing with you. Okay. Now, with that said, let me remind you, if there are objections you'd like me to answer, mention in the comment section or send me a me message on Facebook. So let's deal with 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Let's deal with it. How do we deal with 1 Corinthians 15, 28? If we believe that the New Testament writers, the apostles, and their companions were Trinitarians. How do we deal with 1 Corinthians 15, 28? If Paul, the blessed servant of Jesus, a true apostle of Christ, was a Trinitarian. Well, let's look at it. <clears throat> and when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So notice, if we're going to read the context later, the context of verse 28, <clears throat> even though you got to read the entire chapter, but in this particular section of 1 Corinthians 15, the particular context of 28 starts at 24. Lord willing, we'll come back and look at the context. But guys, please help me to help you focus, listen, and ask the Spirit to fill me so I can bless you in understanding what the Scriptures teach. Okay. <clears throat> now, here it says, after Jesus destroys all enemies, the last of which is death. After Jesus destroys death. Thank you, scammers. May the Lord Jesus use information to keep blessing you, illuminating you, enlightening you until you see the fullness of the truth of scriptures and embrace them fully for the glory of the triune God. Now, it says after he destroys death, he will then subject a reconciled creation to God. Now, what, what does that mean? It means until Jesus returns to destroy death, there's going to be forces in opposition to God, in conflict with God's will, opposing God's rule, and trying to create disunity, chaos, and spread misery. Paul is saying the resurrection of Jesus guarantees the day will come where our Lord Jesus Christ will destroy all opposition, will remove all opposing forces by his almightiness, because he's the all-powerful son of God, he will destroy everything and anything that refuses to repent and turn to God. He will remove them so that he will present to God a fully reconciled heaven and earth in which there will be no more opposition to the rule of God, but perfect peace, union, harmony with God and all creation. It's not just his humanity, Sneakers Corner. Be patient. This is where you're going to get yourself in trouble. It's not just Jesus as man is subject to the Father. Even as the Son, in some sense, he subjects himself to the Father. Just be patient. Guys, help me to help you. Don't pontificate. Here's the time to learn. Hear what I have to say. Go back and prayerfully go, go over the material and study it. And if you see I'm wrong, fine. Ask the Spirit to correct me. But when you start pontificating like Sneakers Corner keeps doing, Equal in essence, but still as the son, in some sense, as the son, he subjects himself to the father. It's not simply his humanity. Help me to help you listen by the grace of God. Honestly, you will benefit. And it doesn't mean everything I say is going to be right. That's where we trust the Holy Spirit to guide me to speak truth. And when I'm mistaken, protect you from that and correct it in me not to repeat it. <clears throat> right? Okay. So now let's read 1 Corinthians 15, 28 in light of what I just said. 1 Corinthians 15, 28 in light of what I just said. Yeah. Mozambique, one thing I'm going to have to teach you guys. Don't split hairs over semantics. You're playing games with words. This is why it gets a little frustrating and it takes me longer to finish a session because I have to correct some of the things said by my brothers and sisters. Notice this. And his humanity is that he is lesser but not subject. Notice the splitting hairs and the playing with words. He is lesser but not subject. You sure about that? You just read in 1 Corinthians 15, 28, he is subject to God. Read it, 1 Corinthians 15, 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then 
shall the son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him. And here's the last phrase. That God may be all in all. This is the goal of creation. As the Lord blesses the internet connection. <clears throat> Please, Lord, for your glory, because it's buffering, because here I'm in my brother's place. So bear with me. Okay. Do you see that last phrase? Do you see that last phrase? God may be all in all. That is Paul's way of saying, when Jesus, our Lord, destroys all opposition, removes every obstacle, and presents to God, to God the Father, a fully reconciled creation, God will be all in all, meaning that God will be in union with everything, in fellowship with, any, with everything, reconciled to everything, and at peace with everything. Did you get what Paul is trying to say here? That's okay, Charles. Origin <clears throat> said a lot of things that are right, said a lot of things that were wrong. Let's focus on the text and not go into the church fathers or other issues. Yeah, thank you, Daily Gripe. If you have questions or objections you want me to answer in future sessions, send me in the comments section. When I say comment section, I mean the videos. All right, now let's focus. Before I move on to the next point, do you understand what 1 Corinthians 15, 28 means? You understand that phrase, God will be all in all. What does that mean? He's not teaching pantheism and panantheism. He's not teaching everything is God and God is in everything in the sense that God is a divine spark and we're part of that divine spark. And if we meditate and do enough breathing exercises, like Asher Dekleta, who has mastered the art of breathing, right, my buddy, that you'll somehow attain God status. He's not teaching pantheism, all is God, or panentheism, all is in God. What he's teaching is, <clears throat> what he's teaching is that God will be in union with everything, at peace with everything, fully reconciled to everything, in fellowship with everything. I just explained what it means, John Link. Okay? Did you guys get what that means? Do you understand what that means? Now, interestingly, Paul uses a similar phrase elsewhere in reference to Jesus' union with the church, his body, his spiritual body. Colossians 3, verse 11. What Paul says about God here, he says about Jesus Christ elsewhere. Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. Okay. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor un uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Wow. Paul could say of Jesus what he said of God, showing that to Paul, Jesus is God, not a creature. Did you guys catch it? It is Christ who is all and in all, in reference to the body of believers. It's not about believers here. It doesn't matter if you're a female believer. It doesn't matter if you're a male believer. It doesn't matter if you're a Jewish believer. You're an African believer. Your skin color doesn't matter. If you're a believer, born of the spirit, Christ is all in and all. He's in union with all of you. He's in fellowship with all of you. He loves every one of you equally to the infinite degree. Right? He's fully reconciled to every one of you. He's at peace with all of you. In other words, he, he's not more in love with the male believers than the female believers. He's not more in love with Jewish believers than Gentile believers. He loves all the members of his body. He's reconciled to all the members of his body. He's in love with all the members of his body. And he will bless all the members of his body. And he's fully reconciled to all the members of his body and will preserve them forever and ever. Everyone with me so far? You know I'm going to have to do multiple parts on 1 Corinthians 15, right? You know I don't finish anything in one session, right? Okay. But now let's compare the language of Colossians 3.11 with 1 Corinthians 15.28. 16.11, have you been able to keep up with my previous sessions? I know you haven't been able to be on the live stream. But I hope you're still learning and benefiting. And 1611 started an apologetics ministry. Pray for him. Pray God will use him mightily and fill him with the spirit because we need more soldiers. 
doing this. Okay, let's put Colossians 3.11 with 1 Corinthians 15.28 back to back. Watch here. <clears throat> Notice, Paul can use the same language for God, right, for Jesus. The language he uses for God, he uses for Jesus. Notice the last part of 1 Corinthians 15.28. That God may be all in all. Colossians 3.11. But Christ is all and in all. One more time. That God may be all and in all. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Please, Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, bless us. Yeah. Buff. Ah, internet. Ah. All right. Sorry about that. It's internet. What are you going to do? Kids buffering. Okay. So notice 1 Corinthians 15, 28. God may be all in all. Colossians 3.11. Christ is all and in all. Do you see how Paul uses the same language for God and Christ? Do you guys see that? Yeah. Well, another filthy barking dog, a rabid dog like his mother. Send this guy out of here. Yeah. You see that? I don't know what's going on with the buffering. Sorry, guys. Hopefully it gets better. I'm going to wait. Yeah, we'll see. All right. Now, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Now that I've given you the background, the context. Jesus subjecting himself to the Father. Does that mean he cannot be God and equal to the Father in essence, in glory, in majesty, and power? Okay, notice. The Son also himself will be subject unto him that put all things under him. Okay. Okay, now notice, the argument of the anti-Trinitarian is, see, the Son will be subject to the Father forever. Therefore, he's not equal to the Father. Okay, what they mean, not equal to the Father, pay attention. Here's what they mean. Not equal to the Father in essence, in glory, in power, and majesty. Because right away, if you guys have trained yourselves to think biblically and logically, and the Holy Spirit has molded your minds and transformed you to think God's thoughts after God. <clears throat> right away, you see the fallacy of this. Just because someone is subject to another does not mean that that individual who's subject is not equal to the other in some sense. For example, 1611 is subject to his father. Does that mean 1611 is less human than his father. That he doesn't have the same human value, human dignity, human worth, and human honor that his father has because he's subject to his father. Yep. Or your employer. You are subject to your employer. You are subject to your employer. But he's human, you're human. Does that mean because my employer is my head and I'm subject to him? That makes me less human than him, that I am inferior in value, in worth, in dignity, and honor. So right away, you spot the fallacy. This is what we call a categorical fallacy, confusing categories. Categorical fa fallacy, confusing categories. The category of essence and being and the category of authority, right? So... Let me show you where this word and the Greek word is used elsewhere. 1 Corinthians 15, 28, the word subject comes from the Greek word hupatasso, hupatasso, okay? 1 Corinthians 15, 28 uses the Greek word hupatasso. This very Greek word is used in Luke 2, 51, Luke chapter 2, verse 51. Exactly, Andrew Martin. You got it. First Corinthians 15, 28 uses the word hupatasso, subject. This same Greek word used of Jesus subjecting himself to Mary and Joseph. Here it is, Luke 2, 51. And he, the 12-year-old Jesus, because the context shows he was 12, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. The son will be subject to the Father, 
and Jesus was subject to Joseph and Mary on earth. But his mother kept all these things saying in his heart. Now, which anti-Trinitarian, which Unitarian heretic, which Jehovah Witness heretic would say that Jesus, the 12-year-old human child, was inferior in essence, in nature, in value, in esteem to his parents, his adoptive father and biological mother, just because he was subject to them. I don't know why you're craving gyros now. Because I said Greek. Did you guys catch it? It's the same Greek word. Luke 2.51, 1 Corinthians 15.28, employ the same Greek word. The child, the 12-year-old human Jesus, became subject to Mary and Joseph. Therefore, using the hermeneutic of Joe's witnesses, Unitarians, and other wicked heretics, agents of the devil, Jesus wasn't truly human. And he was inferior in essence, in value, in esteem, in dignity, and honor to his human parents because he was subject to them. So right there, I can end the discussion. I can stop there and say, okay, so what the son is subject to the father? How does this show that Jesus is not God and equal to the father in another sense? Just like Jesus is subject to his human parents, so in one sense, he's less than them in authority. In another sense, he's just as much human as they are. So as a human being, he has just as much self-worth, value, dignity, esteem, and integrity that they do. Right? Clear? And by the way, Remind me to keep posting the articles. Here's my articles on this issue. I have two articles that I want you to read. Lord willing, when I'm done, I'm going to put in the description box. Here's the first article. I'm going to post it three times. Click and save the article. It's all about 1 Corinthians 15, 28. And here's the other article. Now, remind me to keep posting these because I should have posted them at the beginning. Okay, now here. Here's the second article. I'm going to post this three times as well. Click, save, study. Use the arguments, pass them on to others. Okay, now, right there, you've refuted the objection. Jesus is subject to the Father as a son is subject to a father, but Jesus is still equal to his Father in essence, in nature, in value, in glory, and honor. He's subject to the authority of the Father without being inferior to the Father in essence, like he's subject to Joseph and Mary in authority, but equal to them in essence, in nature, in value, in glory, in dignity. Okay, Mozalbit, if I have to explain this, you know, I'm, I think I'm going to block you. So Jesus is not a different divine person from the Father. Okay. Mozalbit. <clears throat> Keep trying to raise up the objections on their side. I'm going to refute those objections, but I'm going to send you on your merry way. Are you a modalist or a Trinitarian? Of course, Jesus' subjection to the Father shows he's a different person from the Father. He's a different divine person from the Father. He's not the same person as the Father. Why would you raise that as an objection? And why would you assume that because I'm giving an analogy of Jesus' relationship to his human parents, somehow... The way he relates to his human parents is identical to the way he relates to God the Father. Do I really need to educate you, brother or sister? Really? Did you know the answer to that before asking me? Before I, I just want to see. Sorry, guys, because I have to get rid of nuisances that want to pontificate, wax eloquent, and impress us with their knowledge. Did you know the answer to your own objection? Sorry, guys. I apologize. I just want to just want to clarify. Mozambique, don't waste my time. Quickly answer. Did you know the answer to your own objection that you just raised? Sorry, guys. Hold on. You got ten seconds to answer. 
10, 9, 8, sorry guys, 7, I have to do this, 6, 5, 4, 3, Okay, send Mosul Beat out of here. Bye-bye. Don't come back. That's what I thought. You wanted to wax eloquent to try to impress us with the knowledge you don't have. Send him out of here. Yeah. Okay. No, Tippy Bear. We don't need Super Chat. I'm unable to do Super Chat. Let me explain this again. No distractions. Let me explain why Super Chat don't work. YouTube, YouTube takes 30% of your super chat. Do you know that? And I learned that from David Wood. So better give through PayPal. If you want to give, give through PayPal, which doesn't take 30%. Do you guys know that? Did you know that YouTube, when you give via super chat, they take 30%. So why? Okay, did you know in Jesus' name in session? Why would I want YouTube to take 30% of God's blessing? The money of the people of God who want to bless me or bless others. Why should I let them take 30%? Why not use another means, another medium that takes less so there's more money that can go into the ministry as opposed to YouTube? 30% of your super chat goes to YouTube. Do you know that? I, and David Wood told me this. He doesn't mind. Folks, I mind. You know why? Let me tell you why. I'm, I'm in full-time ministry. If you want to get rich, you don't go into ministry. Ministry is not to become financially rich. Ministry is to store up treasures in heaven. Ministry is to become rich in heaven, right? Your riches in heaven. You want me there? So if you guys want to contribute a one-time gift or you want to contribute where it gets to me really quickly, PayPal. Send it to my email, PayPal. Thank you. Now, they don't mind. David Wood doesn't mind. Vocab doesn't mind. John doesn't mind. Right? Guys, I mind. Maybe if I have 400,000 subscribers and 1,000 viewers, it'd be a different story. Right? Derek, what I'm going to do with it is I'm going to buy a plane ticket, hunt you down, find where you live so I can lay hands on you and bless you. Right? Yeah, if you guys want to go give to give quickly. See, now notice how stupid Derek is. He's stupider than Muhammad. He makes Muhammad look intelligent. I just said that Jesus is not the father. Only someone as stupid as Muhammad could say, submitting to yourself. Derek, why are you as stupid as Muhammad? Try to be a little smarter. His excuse was he's illiterate. What's your excuse? So send this guy on his way. Now, in Jesus' name, let's focus. Everyone with me there? Yeah. Exactly. See, isn't it amazing how God exposes the heretics, Riaz? It's that same dog that we just bounced who was trying to wax eloquent. Right? Isn't it amazing? Glory to the triune God. May the Lord Jesus purify us in his blood, fill us with the spirit, to be loving, compassionate, but bold as lions, and to spot wolves in sheep's clothing and to muzzle them. Right? Okay, now, with that said, let's focus. Now, don't let Satan distract. So far, you're learning, right? Just because the son is subject to God, that doesn't make the son less divine. It means that in some sense, the father has authority over the son, but they are equal in another sense. So let me explain this. Please, I hope you understand. I want you to understand this. I don't know what happy-go-lucky is talking about, but that's okay. I'm going to just focus. I'm not going to get distracted here. Okay. You can be subject to a person, making that person greater than you in one sense, but also be equal to that person in another sense. And I gave you the examples. Jesus was subject to Joseph and Mary. So in one sense, Joseph and Mary were greater than Jesus in authority. But in another sense, Jesus is fully equal to Mary and Joseph because he's just as human as they are. And being a true human being, he has the same self-worth, dignity, value, and honor they do. And in another sense, being God, he's infinitely greater and better than them because he created them. Right? Luke 2.51, 51, 
Same Greek word, subject himself to his parents, use of the son being subject to the father. So don't confuse the categories, category of essence and being and category of rank, position, and authority. So imagine you have two categories. One category being in essence, another category, you know, authority, position, and rank. The father and son are equal in essence, in being, in majesty, in glory, because they are truly fully God. But because he's the son who's also man, he is subject to the father as the divine son and as a man, and the father is his head and has authority over him. Is that clear? If you got that thus far, we can now build on this. If someone's confused, let me know. If anyone's confused, say I'm a little confused. Thank you, scammer. All right. Okay. If no one's confused, so Jesus as God is equal to the Father in essence, in nature, in glory, in value, in majesty. But still as God being the Son, being the divine Son, there's a sense in which even as God, the Son of the Father, He's subject to the Father, even as God. But then when you add his human nature, because he's not just God, he's God who became man. And now he has an additional nature, a nature that he created, a nature that's part of creation, a nature that's temporal, a nature that has a beginning, a human nature that he took to himself when he entered the blessed womb of his blessed virgin mother by the power of the Holy Spirit. In that nature, as a man, God is greater than him, not just in authority, but also in essence in that nature. Right? You with me there? So with Jesus, you have a unique situation. You have a person who has two, two, two natures. As God and as man, he's one person with two natures. That human nature, he took on. The divine nature, he's always had. So now it becomes a little more complicated because Jesus isn't simply God. He's the God-man. So there is a sense in which the Father is greater than him in authority and in essence. The Father is greater than the Son in essence in regards to his human nature. But even Jesus' divine nature is greater than his human nature. So now let me really blow your minds away. Even Jesus' divine nature is greater than his human nature. So it's not simply that the Father would be greater than Jesus in respect to his human nature, that the Father's essence is greater than Jesus' human nature. Jesus' own divine essence would be greater than his human nature. Clear? Before I move on? And the Holy Spirit being God would be greater than Jesus in respect to his human nature. The essence of the Spirit would be infinitely greater than the human nature of Christ. So let me repeat it. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as God, Father and the Son and the Spirit being God, they would all be infinitely greater than Jesus' human nature in respect to the human nature of Christ. So there's a sense in which that Jesus' his own nature, his divine nature, is greater than Jesus' human nature. I want that to sink in. Because now that I gave you this, I'm going to go into in-depth exegesis of 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Woods apologetics is worse, Converse. Ben Christian, my brother from a different mother. I just said, if you got it, I'm going to go into the in-depth exegesis proving from Paul that he believed Jesus is Jehovah God of the Old Testament. So if Paul believes that Jesus is Jehovah God of the Old Testament, in what way could Paul think that Jesus is infinitely lesser than the Father, apart from the fact that he has a human nature? You want me there? I just want to make sure you got it before I go into the exegesis. 
before I go into exegesis, did you get this thus far? Because I'm going to have to do multiple parts on 1 Corinthians 15. Okay? And when I'm done with 1 Corinthians 15, 28, it's now going to be arch archived by the grace of the triune God. Therefore, you won't need to ask me, how do we deal with 1 Corinthians 15, 28? Because it's now going to be archived, full exposition. You have the answer. Okay? So, let me now set forth a case that from Paul's letters, specifically 1 Corinthians, Paul has already depicted Jesus as Jehovah God Almighty, distinct from the Father. Okay? That's what I want to show you. Because note, folks, 1 Corinthians 15 is not the start of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15 comes 14 chapters after the first chapter. Why in the world would someone want to quote to me a verse near the end of the book? Because 1 Corinthians 15 is the second to last chapter. And ignore all that Paul has said up to that moment. Is that how you do exegesis? Is that how you study a book to understand the book? You ignore all that the author said from chapters 1 to 14 and focus on the second to last chapter to make your case. Really? You think that's what Paul wanted you to do? Or does Paul assume... You've read carefully up to this point so you'll understand what he means and doesn't mean. Right? So what am I going to prove from Paul's letters, specifically 1 Corinthians? I may look at 2 Corinthians. I'm going to prove to you from 1 Corinthians, Paul has already affirmed, proclaimed, pay attention, Paul has begun this letter affirming Proclaiming Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty of the Old Testament. The eternal son who's not the father, different from the father, but he is equal to the father in essence, glory, power, and majesty. Though subject to him in authority and in respect to his human nature, all the more subject. You not ready for that proof? Are you ready for the proof? You sure? Pray we get more subscribers and like button. Viewers, and that's information studied by more people to use it for the glory of Christ. Okay. Let's look at the first two verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Pray for the internet connection. May the Holy Spirit make us holy to delight the heart of Jesus. Never grieve him, crucify our flesh, and beatify us. With the beauty of Jesus, please. First Corinthians chapter one, verses one to two. Thank you, Walter Jesus. That's another one we'll get to, but that's chapter 10, Walter. We're gonna work our way from chapter one down. Obviously, I'm not gonna look at every verse, right? Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and so so stay this our brother. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for thinking I'm handsome. You're probably one of the few people. Okay, now, verse 2, folks. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Wow. Post that one more time. Let's unpack this meat. Okay, let's unpack this meat. Okay, one more time. Get ready to be blown away. Okay, watch here. They call me the Bruce Lee of Christian apologetics. Even though he wasn't a believer, I do pray he came to know Jesus before he died. To be the Bruce Lee of apologetics is an honor. You know why? Because Bruce Lee was the greatest martial artist. So it's like Walter. Okay, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. Read with me. Don't hate that I can still... Jiggle my chest muscles. First Corinthians 1, 2. <clears throat> unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. Unto the church at God, which is at Corinth. To them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Right there, Paul just showed that Jesus is Jehovah. 
Notice he says that Christians were characterized by this practice. Christians were known wherever they were, all over the place, for this practice of calling on the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. Calling on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Now let me show you why this is mind-blowing. To a first century Jew who knows the Old Testament and is steeped in the Old Testament. Genesis 12 verse 8. Remember, when Paul wrote this, he wrote this around 55 AD. 20 years after the resurrection of Christ. 20 years after the resurrection of Christ, Paul could say, Christians were known all over the world. Wherever there were Christians, they were known for this practice. One of their characteristics happened to be that they called on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, their Lord and ours. Why is that significant? And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east, and there he built an altar unto Jehovah and called upon the name of Jehovah, the Lord. What? Paul, you're a first century monotheistic Jew, a Pharisee, student of Gamaliel, steeped in the Hebrew Bible. You, along with all the Christians, Jews and Gentiles, are known for calling on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ? Yep, that's a characteristic of, our, of ours. We're known for that practice. But Paul... The Old Testament says true believers are those who call on the name of the Lord Jehovah. Genesis 21:33. Genesis 21:33. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of Jehovah, the everlasting God. Wait. The second time that we're reading about Abraham's practice, notice Abraham was known, characterized for his habit of building altars wherever he went and calling on the name of Jehovah. So you're telling me in the first chapter and the second verse of the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul has ascribed to Jesus an act of worship which the Old Testament ascribes to Jehovah alone? Yeah, Beer Sheba means the well of the seven or the well of the oath. Sheba can mean seven or it can mean oath. Sheva. Abdul al -Halaj. Oh, but it gets better. Deuteronomy 4, verse 7. Deuteronomy 4, verse 7. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as Jehovah our God? is in all things that we call upon him for. Wait, 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 wait. Jehovah, our God, is the God we call on who answers us, unlike the other nations who don't have a God like we do, who's so close to us that when we call on him, he answers. Oh, but I'm not done yet. Hold on. Let's go to Psalm 99. Psalm 99. <clears throat> Five to seven. But we're going to look at Psalm 99, six. Psalm 99, five to seven. Watch here. Exalt ye Jehovah our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among them that call upon his name. They called upon the name of Jehovah, and he answered them. He spake unto them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. Wait. Samuel, Moses, Aaron, Abraham, all the prophets, all true believers, called on the name of Jehovah in worship, called on the name of Je Jehovah in thanksgiving, called on the name of Jehovah to praise him, called on the name of Jehovah for their needs. Okay. Psalm 116, verse 2 and verse 4. Psalm 116, verse 2 and verse 4. Watch here. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. He listens to me because he loves me, so I'll keep calling on him as long as I live. 
Verse 4, then called I upon the name of Jehovah, O Jehovah, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Same chapter, Psalm 116, verse 13 and 17. Same chapter, verse 13 and 17. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord, Jehovah, Yehovah. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of Jehovah, Yehovah. Psalm 145, 18. Watch here. Psalm 145, 18. The company. The Lord Jehovah is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. Are you seeing the pattern the Old Testament saints? You call on the name of Jehovah from a sincere heart. You call on the name of Jehovah to praise him, to thank him, to worship him, to ask for your request. You call on the name of Jehovah to save you from hell, save you from your enemies, save you from diseases. You call on the name of Jehovah alone. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. One more time. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. Now let's see if you appreciate what you read in the first chapter of the second verse of 1 Corinthians. Long before 1 Corinthians 15. Okay. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call... Upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Did it sink in? The second verse of the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, before you got to 1 Corinthians 15, Paul has already attributed to Jesus a function that anyone who knows the Old Testament would realize belongs to Jehovah God alone. Paul, why are you Christians the world over known for this practice of calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ when you know what the Old Testament says. Did everyone get it? Did it sink in? Did it sink in or no? Before I move on, I want to make sure it sunk in. <clears throat> Folks, can I ask you then a question if you're getting it? Because you guys are awfully silent, which is fine. As long as you're listening and understanding. Why then would someone have the audacity to quote 1 Corinthians 15, 28 to show that Jesus can't be God because the Son is subject to God, ignoring all the chapters that came before it where Paul goes out of his way to identify Jesus as Jehovah God in the flesh, distinct from the Father, the Son of, Son of God. Why would they do that? Do you think... They really care what the Bible says, or they're so demonized, they just want to assault and blaspheme the glory of Jesus by refusing the knowledge who he is. Are you sure it's willingly ignorant, or it's more of being demonized, and that demon in them is causing them to hate the real Jesus, who is Jesus of history, who's Joel in the flesh. They can put up with a false Jesus, satanic counterfeit, but they can't love the true Jesus. Now, with that said, let's go to 1 Corinthians 1, 3. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 3. Well, we're already into it. It's like now, what, uh, an hour. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 3. Okay, watch here. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 3. Grace be unto you and peace from... God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. See, guys, I don't even think you understand the implication of that. This is what's known as an invocation, where the man of God invokes God to bless the congregation with spiritual blessings. Okay? Notice when Paul invokes God to grant spiritual blessings to the church at Corinth, Notice who he invokes. How many? Let's look at it again. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 3. 
First Corinthians 1, verse 3. Yep. Adoheno. Adoheno. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father. Now, if Jesus is a creature, you got to stop there. And from the Lord Jesus Christ. Wait, 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 wait. What are you doing, Paul? Paul, you know the Old Testament. You're a Pharisee of Pharisees, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a student of Gamaliel. You were steeped in the Old Testament. Paul, you know you cannot quote a single passage in the Old Testament where saints on earth invoke someone other than Jehovah in heaven to grant his spiritual blessings and favors upon his people. When they invoke a being in heaven to grant spiritual blessings, they invoke God alone to bless the people of God with the spiritual blessings of God. Why are you invoking God the Father and Jesus Christ if Jesus isn't God? Let me prove it to you. Number 6, 24 to 26, but we're going to read number 6, 22 to 26 for context. Number 6, 22, 26. So pay attention. This is known as the priestly benediction, the Aaronic blessing, where the priest would bless Israel in the name of Jehovah. Now notice. And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, saying, On this wise you shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, Watch, Jehovah bless thee and keep thee. Jehovah make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Grace of Jehovah be on you, Israel, which was the Old Testament church of God. Right? Jehovah lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Wait, 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 wait. Here you have a priestly benediction, an ironic blessing. Where God tells Moses, this is how the priests are to bless my people. They will invoke me to be gracious to them, grant them peace, and bless them. Now, did they include anyone else besides Jehovah? Or did they invoke Jehovah alone? Who did they invoke to pour out grace, peace, blessing upon Israel? Yahovah, Yahweh alone, right? Jehovah alone. Oh, but wait, 1 Corinthians 1 3 again. Nope, it's not a coincidence, medic. It's a Trinitarian benediction because God is triune. But 1 Corinthians 1 verse 3 again. Watch here. Grace be unto you, Jehovah be gracious unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. See, I can end it right there. Right there I can say, see, whatever 1 Corinthians 15, 28 means, it does not mean that Jesus the Son is Jehovah God in the flesh, equal to the Father in essence, glory, majesty, power, and honor. It simply means as the Son of God, he's subject to his Father in authority, and also because he took on human nature, in respect to his humanity, the Father will be greater than him. End of story. What's the next objection? You see how easy it is to demolish the lies, the distortion, and the blasphemies against the Trinity if you know the Bible? I can stop there. It's done. But I won't stop. I won't stop. I'm going to make a thorough case for what 1 Corinthians 15, 28 does not mean and what 1 Corinthians 28 actually means. But real quickly, let me unpack 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. Let me unpack 1 Corinthians 1, chapter 1, verse 2 one more time. Okay. One more time. Because I want to explain what it means here when he says. <clears throat> okay. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. I want to explain because it's not just enough to read a passage you want to understand. Paul is saying the believers at Corinth in this location have been sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints. Let me explain what he means, sanctified. You have been those set apart by Jesus, because of Jesus, for Jesus, in relationship to Jesus. God chose you out of the world for the glory of Jesus. God chose you out of the world for the sake of Jesus to be the possession of Christ so you can be in fellowship with Christ and Christ in fellowship with you. And this calling you out of the world, separating you from the world, 
in respect to Christ, in relation to Christ, for the sake of Christ, to belong to Christ, to enjoy Christ, to be in fellowship with Christ. That act makes you a saint. A saint means a separate one. You get my point? You are no longer a part of the world. Paul is saying, as someone professing faith in Jesus, you are a separate one because the word saint, if you look at the Greek word, kadosh, or the Greek, I'm sorry, the Hebrew word kadosh and the Greek word hagios, it means separated, set apart. What does it mean a believer is separated, set apart? You've been set apart, separated from the kingdom of Satan, from the control of Satan, from the influence of the world and from sin. You've been set apart from that. You've been set apart to be in fellowship with Christ, in union with Christ, to walk with Christ, to love Christ and enjoy Christ because you belong to him. What's the implication? If I am a separated one, I no longer belong to the world. I no longer belong to Satan and his kingdom. I no longer belong to Satan. So I don't think like the world. I don't act like the world. I don't agree with the world when it opposes God. I belong to Christ. I'm in fellowship with Christ. He's in fellowship with me. I think God's thoughts after him. Meaning, if the world says it's okay to have sex before marriage and God says no, I say no to the world, yes to God. If the world says it's okay to murder unborn children, I say no to the world and yes to God. No, it's not okay. That is a life. And yes, that life is worth fighting for. That's what it means. Exactly sort of truth. That's why the world's going to start hating you. So you understand what your responsibility is as a called out one, a separated one, a sanctified one in Christ. What it means is when God separates you from Satan, he doesn't separate you for the sake of Muhammad and brings you in fellowship with Muhammad. Anyone that the true God separates from the world and its power and its control and from Satan and sin, he will separate them because of what Christ did for the sake of Christ, to belong to Christ, to be in union with Christ. There is no saint who's not a believer in Jesus, the true Jesus, not a false Jesus. So there are no Muslim saints. There are no Buddhist saints. There are no Jewish saints. There are no Jehovah Witness saints. There are no Unitarian saints. The only true saint is one who belongs to the true Jesus, who's God Almighty in the flesh, the second person of the Godhead. That's what it's saying. Yes, Jotlink, we are a thorn in the world's flesh. That's what Paul meant in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. Do you understand now what he's saying? Now, what's beautiful about the Bible, the Holy Spirit inspired the Bible in such a way that the authors of the Bible make statements in passing that gives us an idea, a window into what they believe. In other words, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, Paul is not focusing on Jesus being Jehovah worthy of worship. He simply mentions that in passing as something that's a given. Everyone knows this. All Christians know this. They not only know it, they've been practicing it. So I'm just mentioning in passing what's common knowledge to all Christians, that Jesus is our Lord whom we call on in worship. But isn't that amazing? 1 Corinthians 1-2 is not a treatise on Jesus being God and needs to be worshipped as God. He simply mentions that in passing, right, as something that's common knowledge to all believers, as something that is a given that he doesn't have to explain or defend. And so many of the passages that we use to prove the Trinity are passages found in context where the focus is not on the Trinity, but are statements made in passing as the author or authors seek to address another issue. Making sense? <clears throat> Are you getting the meat? Is it sinking in? 
Is it blowing you away? The depth, the beauty, the supernatural divine consistency of the scriptures and how clear the scriptures are. God is triune. Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh. It couldn't be any clearer. Even a blind man, if he's honest, can see. Right? Okay. Remember, I'm going to do multiple parts on 1 Corinthians 15, 28. I have a lot of series. If you keep praying for my health, for my holiness and purity, for my children to be protected, blessed, and provided for, for miraculous deliverance from this wicked system, free me from all shackles, right? For the provision, I'll keep doing this as long as the Lord wants me to do. That's okay, Brother Andrew. I got issues, and I need tissues for my issues. I'm a prophet, and I'm a poet, and now you know it. All right, now, 1 Corinthians 1, 7 to 9. 1 Corinthians 1, 7 to 9. Let's look at this. 1 Corinthians 1, 7 to 9. So that ye come behind in no gift. You lack no gift. Waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now pay attention to verse 8. Who shall also confirm you unto the end that we may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay. Two things. Number one, it says that all believers enjoy fellowship, communion, intimacy with God's Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and that Jesus Christ will keep you blameless and preserve you for the day of judgment so that when he comes, you'll be blameless in his sight and he won't destroy you. Okay, folks, that's the first point. Let me ask you a question. What kind of attributes must Jesus have to be able to preserve all true believers perfectly, making them blameless in the sight of God, so that when he shows up, they won't be destroyed, they won't be object of his wrath, but they'll be the object of his blessing and salvation, because he will preserve them blameless so they don't get cut off and end up being destroyed. And what kind of attributes must Jesus have that all believers are able to speak to him, have fellowship with him, walk with him, and be in love with him, and he in love with us, and in fellowship with us. That's what Paul just said. That's what he said. Jesus will confirm you, preserve you until the end, will confirm you blamelessly. And all of you have been given the same honor of being in fellowship with Jesus, where you can speak to him and he hears you and he speaks to you. So hold on, hold on, hold on. You're telling me in the first nine verses of chapter one, we've established that Jesus is worshiped as Jehovah, that Christians in 55 AD, Jews and Gentiles in 55 AD, were worshiping Jesus the same way that the Old Testament's worshiped Jehovah. Pray to Jesus and ask Jesus for spiritual blessings in the same way that the Old Testament saints invoked and prayed to Jehovah for spiritual blessings. And in 55 AD, in the first nine verses of the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, Jesus is said to be omniscient because he must know who all the believers are, omnipresent because he must be present with all believers to the same degree if they're able to have fellowship with him and enjoy his presence and he in fellowship with them and omnipotent, he must be powerful enough to preserve all believers blameless till his return. And you still want to convince me that 1 Corinthians 15, 28 is a denial that Jesus is God. Are you serious? Are you serious? You want to insult my intelligence? Thank you, Anna Groin. What they did in the fourth century is simply codify and articulate what the Bible already taught. <clears throat> okay. So now you still want to convince me that 1 Corinthians 15, 28 denies that Jesus is God. We're not even done with the first chapter, folks. First nine chapters. 
I mean, sorry, first nine verses of chapter one. But wait, you forgot something in 1 Corinthians 1 8. The second point, 1 Corinthians 1 8. First Corinthians 1 7 to 9. Verse 8. First Corinthians 1 8. Who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. First Corinthians 5 5. Now here you're really going to get blown away, blown away. And I'm going to sum up and I'm going to do a part two, God willing. Okay. First Corinthians 5 5. To deliver such a one unto Satan for destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Again, get ready to be blown away. Some of you already know this. Paul is a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Jew, a Pharisee, a student of Gamli, Gamliel, one of the greatest rabbis who ever lived, the son of Hillel, <clears throat> and was steeped in the Old Testament. Paul did something that's shocking, and Paul didn't invent this. And I'll explain what I mean. He took the phrase of the Old Testament the day of Jehovah, and now called it the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Something utterly blasphemous of Jesus as a creature. That phrase, the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, the day of the Lord Jesus, is Paul's way of saying the day of Jehovah. You don't believe me? Zephaniah 1, 7 to 9. Zephaniah 1, 7 to 9. And you're right, Matt, for thinking that. Oh, yeah, Charles Dickens, watch. Oh, wait, wait. All throughout the Old Testament, the day of Jehovah. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord Jehovah. For the day of Jehovah's at hand. Bam! End of story. For the day of Jehovah's at hand. For Jehovah hath preferred a sacrifice, he hath bid his guests. And it shall come to pass in the day of Jehovah's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children, and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. In the same day also will I will I punish all those that leap on the threshold, which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. Paul, how dare you take that phrase, the day of Jehovah, which refers to the time where Jehovah will come and destroy his enemies, and call it the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, what are you doing? Paul's saying, I didn't do anything. I'm simply repeating what was already taught and accepted and known by the Christians before my conversion. Same chapter, Zephaniah, chapter 1, verses 14 to 17. Zephaniah, chapter 1, verses 14 to 17. Okay. The great day of Jehovah's near. Guys, we can now close the session and go home. The great day of Jehovah's near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, Yahovah, Jehovah, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers, right? <clears throat> and I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against Jehovah the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. The day of Jehovah, the great day of Jehovah, the great day of Jehovah's wrath, the great day of wrath, the great day of judgment. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 1 verse 8 again. Melvin, you know I'm going to block you, right? Melvin, you know I'm going to send you on your merry way. If I have to explain that passage to you, you, you should not be here. 1 Corinthians 1.8, 1 one more time. Who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5. First Corinthians 5, verse 5. Is Paul amazing, truly, filled with the Spirit, who truly 
was given a revelation of the true God, and he truly fell in love and believed Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, guys, help me understand. In chapter 1, verse 8, the day of judgment, the day of wrath, the day of reckoning is said the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And 5.5 5 says the same thing. You just read in the Old Testament, and here's my challenge to every one of you, and Abdel al-Halaj can prove me wrong. Show me a single place in the Old Testament where that day of judgment in the Old Testament is said to be the day of someone other than Jehovah or the day of Jehovah and a creature. The re repeated emphasis of the Old Testament is it's the day of Jehovah, the day of the Lord, the day of Jehovah, the day of the Lord. Why then did Paul call it the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, the day of the Lord Jesus? Why did he do that? How dare he do that? Now, First Kings eight thirty nine. First Kings eight thirty nine. Let's look at something. Hold on. Hold on. I gotta see something. Yeah. First, First Kings eight thirty nine. Pay attention. Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive, and do, and give to every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest. For thou, even thou, only knowest the hearts of all the children of men. So only Jehovah knows the hearts of all the children of men, right? Okay. Now, First Chronicles 28, verse 9. May the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, enable and recall Scripture perfectly and live it out. Sometimes my computer shuts down, man. I get tired of it. First Chronicles 28, verse 9. First Chronicles 28, verse 9. Watch this. Yep, a filthy dog, a dog of the devil. Barking again because he's upset as his mother. Okay, First Chronicles 28, verse 9. Watch here. Before the rapture, Protestant, don't leave us behind. 99. Red balloons. Okay. And thou, Solomon, my son, know. Yeah, I'm Hold on. We're buffering. Hold on. Yeah, my goodness. All right. First Chronicles 28, verse 9. Hopefully, the buffering's gone. And thou, Solomon, my son, know that the God of thy father, know thou the God of thy father, know who you, the God of your father is. Serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For Jehovah searcheth all hearts. And understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. So now, don't forget, Jehovah alone knows the hearts of all the sons of men. And here, David tells Solomon, Jehovah seeks the hearts and knows the imaginations, the desires of the heart. Right? Did you guys see that before I move on? You guys got it? So who's coming in the day of Jehovah? The day of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 7. Who's coming to judge and repay? 1 Corinthians 1, 7. So that you don't need to guess. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 7. Watch here. Running nose. Sorry, guys. Well, other the weather. So that ye come behind no gift, lack no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's no doubt. As far as 1 Corinthians is concerned, it is Jesus who's coming. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's the day of Jesus Christ our Lord, right? According to Paul, the one who's coming, whose day it is to judge, is the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Like we established that. Okay, because if we establish that, 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 5. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 5. Pay attention to verse 5. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 5. 
But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judge of you. I'll come back and explain what he means. Or of a man's judgment, yea, I judge not mine own self. Uh, he skipped four, verse 4. I don't know what's wrong with this guy. Let's try this again, Protestant. I'm going to fire you. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 5. I don't know. I guess you don't like 4. One more time. You drop the ball. I'm going to hurt you bad, buddy. I swear I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to hurt Samoe too. And I'll hurt him worse. Okay, 1 Corinthians 4. By the way, folks, I'm joking, so you don't go report me and get me arrested. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 5. Okay? Right, Sargon? Darn it. You can't get good help anymore. I pay this guy nothing for nothing. Right? All right. 1 Corinthians 4, 3 to 5. Pay attention. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judge of you, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself, yet I yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. 1 Corinthians 1, 7 says, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord here is Jesus. Don't judge anything until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. Wait, did you catch it? When our Lord Jesus comes, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the day of Jesus Christ, our Lord will make manifest everything hidden in our hearts, unveil the secret counsels and imaginations of our heart. How dare Paul ascribe to Jesus what 1 Kings 8.39 and 1 Chronicles 28, 9, ascribe to Jehovah alone. Jehovah alone knows the hearts of all the sons of men. Jehovah alone knows the imaginations of the hearts of the sons of men. And it is the day of Jehovah when Jehovah comes to judge the world. All of which Paul just attributed to Jesus. Let that sink in. He just attributed all of this to Jesus. Folks, we're not even anywhere near 1 Corinthians 15, huh? We're nowhere near 1 Corinthians 15. Notice how much meat in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And you still have the audacity to go to 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Butcher that passage to make it say something that Paul had no intention in saying. How dare you, you son or daughter of the devil. Take this blessed apostle of the triune God who worshipped and loved Jesus as Jehovah God in the flesh. Take what he said in the second to last chapter. Butcher it to make him say something contrary to what he's been saying all throughout that book. How dare you. The Lord doesn't grant you repentance and you deserve the judgment that the Lord will bring upon you for doing this to the inspired writing of this blessed servant of the triune God. Right? <clears throat> Clear? Okay. Let me now wrap it up by breaking down 1 Corinthians 4, 3 to 5. Because I'm going to do a part two. I'm still nowhere near finished. We're going to end it with 1 Corinthians 4, 3 to 5, because now I want to bring out the point he's making. Let me explain so you don't misunderstand. Practical application, how does it apply to me today as a Christian? <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 5. Read. Superfluous, were you preordained, predestined to ask me that question? So did were you predestined to ask me that silly question? Superfluous? Because I want to make you superfluous in a minute. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 5. But with me, it is a far, very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. Pay attention. Okay? Because I want to break down what his point is. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. Superfluous and sword. This is what happens when you get into side talks and side issues. You distract me to distract people, then I got to rebuke you. Stop and focus. Okay. 
Now, for the rest of you, let me explain what Paul is saying. <clears throat> Some of you may be a hard, have a hard time following what the Shakespearean English is saying. Let me break it down. Listen, Paul is saying, I could care less what you have to say about me. I could care less what others have to say about me. Your judgment means nothing to me. It's only God's judgment that counts. In fact, my own judgment of myself, pay attention, doesn't mean anything. What does he mean? As far as I'm concerned, I haven't done anything to deserve people to criticize me and attack me and question my character. As far as I, I know, I've done nothing to deserve this false judgment, slander. And so you can slander me. You can judge me. I could care less about your judgment. You're not my judge. God will judge me. And as far as my conscience is, co is concerned, I am clear because I'm not aware of anything that I've done to make me blameworthy. But then he says something shocking. Pay attention. However, that doesn't mean I'm acquitted. And that doesn't mean I'm right. Even though I'm not aware that I've done anything to deserve this slander and accusation, and my conscience is clear, I may be wrong. I may be self-deceived. That's why when Jesus comes, he will then reveal the hidden motives of my heart and show me whether I am wrong or I'm right because I may think that there is nothing to condemn me, but I may be wrong, which is why I don't even trust my own self-judgment. I will entrust myself to the judgment of Christ because then Jesus will make known to me if I was self-deceived or was I right to think I've done nothing to deserve the slander and condemnation. You understand this point there? You see what he's trying to say? As far as I'm concerned, I've done nothing to disqualify me to justify these accusations and slander that I'm a false apostle. So I could care less if that's what you think. You can judge me as a false apostle. The Lord will vindicate me. However, even though <clears throat> I'm not aware of anything to make me deserving of your condemnation, I still may be wrong because God knows the inner recesses of my mind and heart, and he will make manifest the intentions, inclinations, and imaginations of my heart, why I did what I did. Now, folks, let me tell you what that means. Let me break down what that means. You will not only be judged for what you have said, how you have said it, and what you've done, and how you did it. God will also judge your motives behind the things you do. In other words, if I'm here preaching for fame, for fortune, for praise, the Lord will expose that on the day of judgment and say to me, that day when you preached, let me show you the true motives of your heart. You didn't do it for my glory. You did it to get attention, accolade, and money. Right? That's why if you try to enter heaven by your works, off to hell you go. That's why you have to cleave to the cross of Jesus Plead the blood of Jesus to wash you and cleanse you. Plead the righteousness of Jesus. Plead the mercy of Jesus and say, Lord, it's not by my works, even in grace, that I enter. It is your righteousness, your blood, your mercy, your grace, your love that I plead. Have mercy on me, son of God, son of David, virgin born, son of Mary. You get it? So with that said, we'll wrap it up. Lord willing, I'll do a part two on 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Right? So with this said, pray for one another. Pray God cleanses our motives, our hearts, our minds, our thoughts, our motives, our inclinations, our souls, our spirits, our mouths, our tongues, our bodies to purify us wholly in the blood of Jesus, to fill us with the Holy Spirit, to give us power to crucify the flesh 
not to indulge the flesh and give in to the flesh, to walk in the life of the Spirit. Pray that he has mercy on us and be patient with us. Pray that we can be patient with one another and love one another for the sake of the Lord. Pray we grow in holiness and righteousness and love and purity and in worship and obedience to his word. Pray for more wisdom and knowledge and understanding of his word. Pray for more boldness, more passion to preach it and not fear the consequences, whether persecution, whether imprisonment, whether death. And do pray for my daughters and I. God will bring us together. Pray for miracle this January, free from all shackles completely in Jesus' name. Pray for the provision for the ministry and to get my place by February. Lord willing, we'll do a part two on 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah, the eternal son of the Father, who became flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit in essence, distinct from them in person, the glorious God-man, Theanthropos, King of kings, Lord of lords, the risen Lord of glory. Lord, cover us by your blood. Come sooner than later and find us blameless, preserved by your spirit, clothed in your righteousness. And please, Lord, Lord Jesus, fight for us and save us. And fight for my children, my daughters. Remind them that I love them and how much you love them. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, here are the articles again before I go. You can contribute to Patreon, my Patreon pages, or you can send something via PayPal to my email, sam underscore s-h-m-n at hotmail.com. Sam underscore s-h-m-n at hotmail.com. Lord willing, I'm going to be switching my Patreon accounts to Christ for the World Ministries and LLC. Pray that happens sooner or later, and I can retain the contributors because I need more, not less. So pray for that. So here's the article, two articles that go with this session. You get it for you? Did I give you that? Hold on. Am I posting the right link? Before I shut down, hold on. Yep. Okay, that's one. Okay. Let me get you the other one. Hold on. Let me get it for you. Hold on. Yep, let me get it. Here's the other one. Oh, boy. I think I lost that one, did I? Okay, here's the other one. Yep, here's the other one. Okay, guys. Oops, sorry. Save the link. Study the material. Hit the like button. Download these videos. Use them for the glory of Christ. Love you guys. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Take care. Save those links.